What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. It's your man's Nicholas. Big dogs gotta eat. Fantasy football, BDGE. If you're joining us on YouTube, if you're joining us via the podcast, I welcome you and thank you for spending your time with me. It is Tuesday, so we're jumping into the top waiver wire ads of week eight. There are a lot of ads this week because there are a lot of injuries going on. So uh, I, I'm not gonna make any Monday Night Football proclamations because I'm actually filming this on Tuesday. My schedule got a little twisted and whatnot. Before we get into the video though, I'm sure a lot of you guys are wondering about the Amari Cooper trade, what my take on that is. So Amari Cooper gets traded over to the Dallas Cowboys who obviously have been without a number one wide receiver for a while now. In return, the Raiders collected a first round draft pick. So they'll have three draft picks, three first round draft picks this upcoming draft and another two. So they have five over the next two years. Obviously they're in complete rebuild mode. <sighs> Do I think it was a good trade? Um, you know, I think it was a good trade for both teams. Clearly it wasn't really working out with Amari Cooper in Oakland. Um, and I don't wanna say they're tanking, but they're tanking. And they will have a lot of draft capital over the next few years. And obviously Gruden being signed to that 10 year contract it is a, they're in it for the long haul. So I know a lot of people will be like, wow, that was crazy that they gave up a first round pick for Amari Cooper on the Dallas side of things. You know, I, I guess I can understand that take. Um, but at the same time, like if you don't think that you were getting a player of Amari Cooper's caliber in the first round this year, then I don't think it was a horrible pick. I mean, he was a first round pick. He has produced uh, to very high levels in the NFL already. And He's still very young, and this obviously means that he will be signed to an extension. For the most, I, I think it pretty much guarantees that they will be re-signing him to a long-term contract, of course. So he will be their number one wideout for the foreseeable future. The problem from a fantasy perspective, of course, is switching teams mid-season is a tough thing to do. The wide receiver not only has to learn the playbook, um, you know, he, he's got to move his entire life from Oakland to. Um, to Dallas and now he has to gain this chemistry with Dak Prescott. He's obviously never worked with Dak Prescott before and the two need to get on the same page, right? And he's got to learn this playbook and I mean, it's Jason Garrett so the playbook is probably like seven pages long anyways. He punts the ball on every fourth down. I'm sure he'll probably start incorporating third down punts soon enough. So Cooper has, you know, less, less plays to actually learn. But at the end of the day, it's gonna to be tough to transition in the middle of the year. Maybe if this was like week three or four, I'd get a little more excited. However, um, I do think that with Cooper, once he gets fully integrated into the offense as the true number one wide receiver here, I think it actually will be a good thing for his fantasy outlook because I think the targets will be more consistent. Um, Cause you look at Dak, you know, whenever he's had a number one target there, whether it was Dez, those are guys that got high, high target share numbers in the offense. So I could see, you know, maybe by week 13-ish, week 12, sometime around there, we could see Cooper getting integrated into this offense and seeing a more consistent target share in the offense and being that true number one wide receiver. Uh, I think Cooper might be a better fantasy play in Dallas now. Um, Cause at this point, I think you almost have to take Dak over Derek Carr cause he's looked terrible. So uh, I don't think it's terrible. Obviously you're not gonna be able to play Cooper for a while. So I would hold on to him. I would definitely stash him until the later parts of the year, especially if you're on a playoff run, because I think that the schedule over the last four weeks for the Cowboys is actually really good. So if he can get acclimated to the offense and become that number one wide receiver there, he has a really nice slate of games. I think it was like weeks 13 to 16. He's got four plus matchups against pass defenses that are super vulnerable. So I'd hold on to Cooper right now, um, but obviously you're not gonna be playing him for a while. So that is my take on that, but let's dive into the top waiver wire ads for week eight. All right, we're starting with the quarterback position as we always do. My computer is updating right now, so I don't have my notes up, but I have them on my phone, so I will be looking at them via the iPhone. First up on the list is Mr. Trubisky. <clears throat> he's owned in 53% of Yahoo League, so he's 47% available. Don't get it twisted. In my opinion, Trubisky still looks pretty bad throwing the ball. His stats have been there, though. He's put together three games in a row of 315 plus passing yards. More importantly, he's using those legs like we expected him to. He's ran for 181 rushing yards and a score over the last three games. So he's averaging 60 rushing yards a game. He's actually quarterback four right now in fantasy football uh, in terms of fantasy points per game. Uh, and then they play the Jets at home next week. 
who looked to be, uh, they were a pretty good defense early on against the pass, but, you know, they've been hit with injuries, Tremaine Johnson and Buster Screen and, and some other, you know, secondary members of that team. So they have let up a lot of, um, a lot of passing yards over the last, m last month or so. Um, multiple passing touchdowns in four straight games and over 300 passing yards to opposing quarterbacks in three of their last four. So he gets the Jets, then at Buffalo, then home against Detroit. So really good matchup slate over the next three. Um, so he's someone that if you need a quarterback, I would you know spend somewhere between five and ten dollars on Trubisky, maybe even more than that because he looks like he's going to be a solid fantasy option. Obviously, he started off slow, but the more this offense gets you know equated and the more they get into this Matt Nagy scheme, the more comfortable everyone's going to get. And Trubisky is obviously coming coming into his own now. Second guy on this list is Baker Mayfield, forty one percent owned, um, and I know it may not have looked pretty for Baker this uh, previous week, but put up 21 fantasy points, which was a season high as well as, a, I guess, by default, a career high. You know, he showed his rushing upside and the floor there. I think he rushed for like 43 rushing yards. So that is something that he will always, you know, antiquate into his game because he is a guy who is sneakily athletic and he will, you know, give you 15 to 20 in some games, 40 rushing yards, which always boosts his fantasy numbers. And you like to see that in a quarterback. Um, so he takes on Pittsburgh in week eight who are allowing the fourth most fantasy points to the quarterback position. And after that, he still has uh, attackable matchups in, you know, at Pittsburgh, then Kansas City at home, Atlanta at home. So Baker, I know it hasn't been like great and he hasn't been putting up ridiculous numbers, but I think the matchups still dictate that you can start him. And that's really all the quarterbacks I have on this list. I mean, Joe Flacco is on there as well. He, he uh, played pretty well last week and um, the matchups aren't fantastic going forward, but he's someone who's been pretty consistent in, you know, putting up a decent floor there. But we'll move on to the running backs. First up on this list is Wendell Smallwood of the Philadelphia Eagles, 50% owned. So he's available in half leagues, owned in half the leagues. But, you know, as Doug Peterson has, and this was one mistake that, you know, we could look back on in the beginning of the year when analyzing players for your fantasy draft, right, is underestimating coaches and their schemes and what they've done in the past. Doug Peterson will always, always, always deploy a running back by committee. And this is the case now. This is the case when Jay Ajayi was there. Everyone was like, yeah, Jay Ajayi has, it's going to be the workhorse. He has that upside. But like, I guess real, <coughs> realistically, he never did because Doug Peterson does not deploy featured backs, really. It's it's always a running back by committee. And that's what we saw um, over the last few weeks since Jay Ajayi has been gone. Now, in their 21-17 loss to the Panthers on Sunday, Wendell Smallwood led the Eagles team, uh, the Eagles backfield in snaps. He had 62% of the snaps in week Six. He had 52% of the snaps in week seven, and he outtouched Clement 11 to 10 in this one. Uh, he outtouched Clement in the previous game as well. So with Ajayi's sideline and Sproles looking like he's nowhere near to uh, his return, it seems like Clement and Smallwood both kind of have double-digit touch floors with, you know, like 15 touch upside, which we saw last week from Smallwood, uh, depending on like game script and depending on maybe like hot hand. So Smallwood's on this list because... Clement's obviously owned in, I don't know, like 75% of leagues, so he doesn't make the actual list in terms of the technicalities behind the list. You know, we get technical shit over here. Um, but Smallwood, you know, like I said, he, I think he's he's good for double-digit touches pretty much every game. He'll mix in anywhere from like two to four catches a game. Um, and uh, I, I don't know. He's just someone that probably should be owned. It could be, you know, RB3 flex option. Now, I'm not going to go crazy only because maybe Sproles will be back in a few weeks. They do get Jacksonville on the road, which is not an easy matchup. Then they have their bye. So it's not it's not a, a fantastic setup for Smallwood, but I think he needs to be mentioned nonetheless. Second on this list is the Oakland backfield. So we have Doug Martin, we have Jalen Richard, right? 24% owned and 22% owned. And, uh, and they're on this list, obviously, because Marshawn Lynch has been designated to the IR. Um, my computer just started up, so I'm going to switch to the computer view for a second. Apologies for that, young sirs, fine gentlemen that you are in my audience. We'll be diving back into the Oakland backfield. So, Marshawn Lynch is on the IR. Rest in peace to Beast Mode. That'll probably be the last carry we see him have in the NFL. Actually, you know, I feel like if, if Beast Mode wants to come back to the NFL, he's going to be back in the NFL, whether it's with Oakland or, or with someone else. So, him on the IR, gone for the year, leaving that backfield up to Jalen Richard and Doug Martin. The way this backfield is very, very likely going to break down is exactly how you would expect it to. Doug Martin is going to get the lion's share of the carries while Jalen Richard gets the lion's share of the receiving work. Neither of them has gotten a goal line carry. Uh, Jalen Richard has one carry inside the 10 yard line on the year, but when they're on the one or two yard line, 
I would probably expect Doug Martin to get that carry. However valuable that might be in your eyes, I don't think that's going to be that valuable of a role in this Oakland offense. After Lynch, right? Richard has played on a backfield high 36% of the team snaps this year. Martin only 14%, but Martin obviously gains the most benefit from Lynch being sidelined because Martin kind of fills into that role. Um, when you exclude Lynch's carry, so if you're just looking at all the running back opportunities of everyone besides Marshawn Lynch, Doug Martin has received 69% of the team's carries, while Richard has seen nearly 80% of the backfield's targets. So obviously, Martin is the guy in standard you probably want to own. Richard is the PPR guy you want to own. If I had to pick one for the rest of the season, I think I would just take Richard straight up because I think he is um, more talented at this point in his career. I think the passing game is going to be more valuable than the rushing game going forward in this Oakland offense, who is probably going to see a lot of negative game script, and thus Jalen Richard should be on the field for a lot of their um, their snaps going forward. So Jalen Richard would be my play. I'm definitely not breaking the bank on either of them because this probably will be a full running back by committee. And it's going to be very hard to, one, trust Doug Martin overall, but two, you know, predict which one of them is going to be used heavily going forward on a week over week basis. So I probably wouldn't spend more than like three to five dollars of fab budget on them. If you're really desperate, maybe I would shoot that up to like 10 or 12 dollars if you're in a PPR league or something, but I'm not going to go crazy about it. Um, and past the Oakland backfield, we're going to move to, actually, before we do, I just want to let you guys know, Big Dogs BDGE is expanding. We are going to be expanding outside of just fantasy football. I'm trying to, I'm trying to build this into, um, almost a media company, a fantasy sports network. So in the very, very, very near future, probably this week, I have to set up the logistics behind the scenes. I want to bring on one two, maybe three people as on-camera personalities to cover other fantasy sports. Um, and maybe fantasy football too, but probably focusing on anything, any other kind of fantasy sport, whether it's fantasy basketball, fantasy baseball, fantasy golf, I don't care. Um, any of that stuff, I will be looking to bring on a few new members of the team to, you know, come onto my YouTube channel and create videos for the channel and for the network. So I will make an individual video with more details on that, but I just want to give you a heads up if any of you guys are interested, if any of you guys speak the language, what I'm looking for is kind of a counterpart to me, someone who is as into these other fantasy sports as I am to fantasy football and you think your personality would mesh with the channel and whatnot and you think you could bring value to the channel. So that is what I will be looking for. So if you are excited about that, leave a comment down below and I will, I will be, again, posting another video with more details and more, um, logistics in terms of what I'm looking for and you know who I'm looking to hire for this for these specific roles but leave a comment down below let me know what sports you play and if you think you'd be a good fit for the channel I would very highly appreciate that but let's get back into the waiver wire ads third on this list is and, and the list goes by the percentage of ownership in Yahoo this is not like the Wendell Smallwood is my favorite ad and Doug Martin is my second favorite this is just in terms of ownership on Yahoo. So third on this list is Ronald Jones of Tampa Bay Bucks, owned in 16% of leagues right now. Peyton Barber came down with an injury, uh, a lower body injury at the end of last week's game. We don't know the extent of the injury. Dirk Cutter says, you know, the injury report comes out on Wednesday. So like, we don't know what's gonna go on. Like, okay, okay buddy, okay, okay, Dirk Cutter. Like you're, you're getting a competitive advantage because you didn't tell us what's going on with Peyton Barber. So. If Peyton Barber misses any time, Jones kind of steps into uh, a bigger workload going forward. When you look at Jones, he's been like unbelievably inefficient this year, not only in, in the regular season, but he was awful in the preseason as well. And I don't think it's just a shoe in that he's actually going to be featured if Peyton Barber misses times. Because you look at the rest of the backfield, right? They do still have Jacquez Rogers, and I obviously like him because they kept him on the roster for this long. Um, he's only, Ronald Jones has only out carried Jacquez Rogers on the year 17 to 12 so far. And he has actually seen two fewer targets and has two fewer receptions than Quiz on the year. So I don't think it's the Ronald Jones show if Peyton Barber does miss time. I think he will be the lead back there, but I don't think it's going to be 20 touches. I don't think he gets the workload that Peyton Barber might have had. And that's if Barber misses time at all. We don't know the extent of the injury, especially of me saying it right now. I'm actually going to open up Roto and see if we have any updates or anything. I don't believe we do. No, nothing new yet. 
So that's just something to keep an eye on. Um, but I'm not anywhere near as excited about Jones as some people will be. I probably wouldn't spend more than five dollars on the uh, on the waiver wire for him. They're at Cincinnati, at Carolina, then against Washington. None of those are easy matchups. So take from that what you would like. Now we go over to the San Francisco 49ers and we're looking at this backfield. Raheem Mostert. Most, I don't know how to say that last name, to be honest with you, but he's owned in 13% of leagues. I'm just going to call him Raheem the Dream. So Matt Breed is clearly hurt. We knew that weeks ago. We knew that going into this game. Then you could tell now by the five snaps that he played in in week seven. Yes, Breed played in five snaps on Sunday. While Raheem the Dream clearly had the best game in the Niners' backfield, um, Yushek still outsnapped the rest of the Niners' backfield. Yushek led the backfield with, I think he had like 36 snaps. Raheem had 22. Alfred Morris was involved with 20 snaps. So Raheem only outsnapped Morris 22 to 20 on the day. But he has put together back-to-back -to -back quality games, right? He uh, he rushed for 59 yards on seven carries on Sunday. So over the last two weeks, he has 146 rushing yards on 19 carries, 7.7 .7 yards per carry. Um, and he added four receptions on Sunday, which is good to see that he can be involved in the passing game as well. But as of right now, I'd expect Matt Breida to sit a few games, and I expect him to miss some time. It's hard. I can't imagine them continuing to play him through this injury right now and not let him rest up a little bit. Tough dude, but at some point you just got to sit because it's better for the team. Um, so it's hard to gauge what this backfield split is going to be like because we saw Morris have 20 snaps compared to Raheem's 22, so it's still very close there, but Raheem obviously had the production in this one. Um, but Morris did outcarry Raheem as well, 9-7 to in this matchup. Kyle Shanahan might just feel more comfortable with Alfred Morris carrying the ball than Raheem. But I, I think he did earn some more playtime, and I think he should get more involved in the offense. But again, it's still a very murky situation. Um, and in my eyes, I don't think he's more than kind of a desperate ad. So I'm not spending more than, than $5 on the waiver for him. They do get a really good matchup against Arizona in Week 8 on the road, and then they get Oakland and the New York Giants at home. Next on this list, we have Chris Ivory of the Buffalo Bills, 8% owned. So Shady had two carries to his name on Sunday before he left with an injury, which at first looked like it was a leg injury. Like you watch the replay and you're like, oh shit, he fucked up his leg, hyperextension, maybe he tore something. Find out later that it was, uh, they were checking him for a concussion. So he left with a head injury. His timetable for return is questionable for week eight. We don't really know what his status is gonna be. Um, but the injury kind of looked bad. So I'm going to, I'm not gonna, I mean, I'm not gonna assume he's gonna be out, but if he does out that, if he is out, then that would put Chris Ivory in line for a very big workload. Um, and we have, you know, historical data to kind of back this, um, this projection up by, right? They lost 37 to five on Sunday. Horrible, horrible game script for a guy like Chris Ivory. He still carried the ball 16 times, went for 81 yards, 5.1 yards per carry. Now, Marcus Murphy is the backup, I guess, to Chris Ivory. And he caught five passes in this one. And he could have a pass catching role if Shady misses time, but I still think that's a very desperate play if you want to go for Murphy. Um, but we look at Ivory's workload when McCoy has been gone, right? So in week three, when McCoy sat, Ivory carried the ball 20 times. He also caught three balls for 70 yards. He caught another three passes on Sunday too. So he's being, you know, involved really heavily on the ground when Shady's not there, but he's also being involved in the passing game, which is good to see. So Chris Ivory has been sneaky good. And I think he's going to be a very sneaky good play in week eight at home versus the New England Patriots if Shady misses time. So if you're desperate for a running back, I would spend upwards of $10 for Chris Ivory this week. And the last two um, guys are based around injuries as well. So I'm looking at the Patriots backfield. I'm looking at the New York Jets backfield. Now we have Sonny Michel, who, you know, it looked like he might be out for the year. Turns out that it wasn't as serious of an injury as most people thought it was going to be. Turns out that he will be week to week. And he's probably doubtful for week eight. However, he could be back in week nine. He could be back in week 10. We don't know. But that leaves the running back spot pretty wide open for the Patriots. All they have left is James White, right? Rex Burkhead's on the IR. Jeremy Hill's gone. It would be pretty surprising if they don't sign someone off free agency or if they don't like promote someone from the practice squad. I believe Mike Gillis, I don't know if Mike Gillis is on their practice squad or if he's a free agent right now, but he obviously knows the system. So it wouldn't surprise me if they bring him in. Uh, Kenjin Barner, Kenjin Barner was the guy who stepped into um, Sonny Michel's role after he left the game last week. I think he carried the ball like 10 times for 30 something yards. So I don't expect Barner to be that that guy in this offense. There's no way they're going to give him 20 carries a game and the goal line work and whatnot. James White becomes an RB1, of course. We have to see what they do 
if they sign somebody. If they sign a Mike Gillisley, I think he is safe to put in lineups as a flex play this week because I think he's going to get a ton of carries in that in that Sony Michelle role. So I'm not going crazy about Barner. I'm not going to go crazy about you know Gillisley if they do sign him. Uh, but it's worth mentioning because Michelle is obviously going to or he's probably going to miss some time. Um, I think they take on the yeah they take on the Bills this week, so it's a, it's a good matchup for the running back position as well. Lastly is the Jets. Uh, we saw Bilal Powell exit the game with uh, I don't even know why a neck injury. So neck kind of tells me that it might be something serious and it could be a multi-week injury. And with Powell gone, right, that that opens up a lot of the passing work in this offense, and it's been pretty valuable in this backfield. Crowell's been horrible since his monster like 200 rushing yard game, and. We had this guy, Trenton Cannon, come in and catch, I think, like six balls for 60-something yards. And I'm like, okay, that's pretty clear what his role is going to be. And it would be a valuable one in PPR leagues. However, uh, Elijah McGuire, the impressive rookie from 2017, just returned to practice this week. I just saw that on Roto World. Let me see. He was on the injured reserve, returned to practice last week. Cannot be activated until next week, but returning to practice... When first eligible is a great sign for his health. Uh, rest of season, I would take Elijah McGuire because he is a more well-rounded running back than Trenton Cannon. But for this week, if you're looking for a, um, if you're looking for just a plug-and-play guy for uh, PPR leagues, I think Trenton Cannon has some sneaky, some sneaky value for Week Eight. I'm trying to look up who their matchup even is. I didn't ever, I forgot to write it down. They play the Bears. Okay, so that's not a good matchup per se. Bears defense has been a little sus as of as of late, so it's not someone that you have to completely avoid. But Trenton Cannon is something to look forward to. He, he, uh, Elijah McGuire is a stash in deeper leagues. I actually might pick him up in my 14-team league now that he's back, depending on the severity of Blah Powell's injury. Um, that's the last running back. So we have a lot of running backs. Nothing I'm like super excited about, but there are some some guys that you could pick up and, and plug and play into your lineup. So let's move over to the wide receivers. Before we do that. I want to thank today's sponsors for the video, FantasyJocks.com. Y'all know they're always repping your bands. FantasyJocks.com, they are the industry leader in any equipment that you need for your fantasy league. Whether it is fantasy football, fantasy baseball, fantasy basketball, it doesn't matter. They have draft boards if you do live draft with your friends. They got those. They have the belts. They have rings. They have awesome trophies like Lombardi-looking trophies that you can get the team's names linked up onto the 24 karat gold plaques they got on these bad boys. Very, very, very high quality stuff they got over there. Um, would highly suggest having a trophy for your league, even if it's a small miniature one. You can check out their um, their availability of the products that they have on their website. Just keep it at your office desk if you win, just to show off a little bit. Perfect for your work league. Uh, you know, have everyone throw in a couple extra bucks on top of the buy-in and you will be playing for a trophy this year or next year. You can use promo code TAKE10 or TACO CORP, T-A-C-O-C-O-R-P, for 10% off your purchase. Your man's got you. FantasyJocks.com. Check them out. Thank you for sponsoring today's video. And uh, also one more thing, if you want my weekly rankings as well as a private live stream and a master stat sheet, you can head over to patreon.com slash bdge. That will be linked below. That is like exclusive access um, to content that I provide to my Patreon subscribers, which is uh, a paid monthly service. So if you are interested in my weekly rankings, which I only post on Patreon, we have a, a weekly live stream where I answer all of your questions every single Wednesday night. So tomorrow night we'll be having our live stream. Uh, you can check out patreon.com slash bdge. And that is... All I have to plug for right now. Move over to the wide receivers. First up on this list is Chris Godwin, Tampa Bay Bucks, 49% own. He is on this list pretty much every week for your mans. And uh, I think we're starting to see Godwin come into that wide receiver two role in Tampa Bay behind Mike Evans. Now, he didn't light up the box score on Sunday. He logged 66% of the snaps on Sunday. And that was ahead of Adam Humphreys, and that was ahead of Deshaun Jackson for the first time this year since week one. Now, his 5 for 59 line, like I said, it wasn't a, a, a box score light up, right? 5 for 59, but it's not terrible. And that seems to be settling in as his floor. Uh, that's like his usual floor on a week-by-week -week ba uh, basis. And he has upside given that he scored in four of six games so far on the year. Now, Godwin is currently on pace for... 69 catches, 821 yards, 10.6 touchdowns on the season. That's paced out to his 16-game line. And that's while only playing on 57% or more of Tampa Bay's snaps twice on the year. So he's online 
for 69, 821, 10.6 stat line on the year, despite not playing in more than 57% of the team's snaps more than twice. If he has a full-time role as that wide receiver too, he is going to put up 75, 1,000, 8 to 10 touchdowns on the year. As his role grows, so will his fantasy value. Next three matchups at Cincinnati, at Carolina, Washington, none of them are easy. But again, going opposite of Mike Evans means that the top cornerback will always be on Evans as long as, you know, they're a shadowing defense. So that's good news for Chris Godwin. And I think he's someone that you want to pick up now and will have a pretty big second half of the season, as I've kind of been saying all along. Second on this list is Robbie Anderson of the New York Jets, 47% owned. Now, Quincy Anunua is going to be out for multiple weeks, right? He missed last week. He's got this high ankle sprain that he's dealing with. Who knows when he's going to be back? Terrell Pryor, also out of the Jets lineup, also off the Jets team. I don't know what the fuck's going on in New York there. They were like, Adam Schefter tweeted out something about like, they're going to cut him and then re-sign him when he's healthy rather than, it's like a two-week injury. I don't know what the fuck is going on, but they cut him for right now. So, you could assume he's not going to be in their lineup for the next couple of weeks. Leaving Robbie Anderson as really their only outside threat. And I was really high on Jermaine Curse last week. But I did put in the caveat that um, there was a red flag. I was excited for Jermaine Curse to operate as the main slot guy. Because he had done so in week 5 and week 6. But I'm like, now they have too many injuries to the point where they're going to have to play Jermaine Curse on the outside. And that takes away his effectiveness. And that takes away the chances of him being that slot receiver. And that's where the targets are. Um, so with all the injuries, they did move Jermaine Curse on the outside and they put Andre Roberts in the slot. Like who the fuck is Andre Roberts? And Andre Roberts ended up with six targets on the game. So that just tells you how valuable that slot position is. Um, so that being said, Jermaine Curse is kind of a, uh, a no factor in this offense if he's not playing in the slot, which means Robbie Anderson is the number one. He saw a, uh, a team high 10 targets on Sunday and, you know, with all the injuries, Robbie Anderson should continue to be the main benefit in this offense of those injuries and and continue to see pretty high volume of targets going forward from Darnold. Um, he has an average depth of target of 21.4 yards. So if he's going to see a high volume of targets plus valuable targets down the field, uh, Robbie Anderson could, you know, give you some pretty, pretty solid fantasy weeks going forward. And while Darnold has been terrible at times, you know, we know that he's not afraid to chuck the ball down the field. So they play at Chicago, at Miami, then against Buffalo. Um, Chicago is obviously not a great matchup, but I don't think they're going to see that many tough matchups going forward. And Robbie's someone I would probably throw between $8 and $12 on the waiver wire for. Next up is Geronimo Allison of the Green Bay Packers, 37% owned. Now, coming off the bye week, I would hope and I'm assuming that Geronimo Allison is going to be healthy and ready to roll in week eight. I haven't heard any reports from practice yet, so we will have to see. He basically missed the last couple of games with a concussion and then hamstring injury, which was kind of uh, out of nowhere. We didn't realize that he suffered some kind of hamstring injury, but they held him out smartly. Um, so he will be returning to game game ready status, hopefully for week eight, uh, as well as Randall Cobb, who's been out for a little while too. Now, when he returns, Jerome Miles, and I expect him to capture that wide receiver two role like he had been for um, the previous four games that he had played in. Now, I would, I would much prefer Allison over Cobb. Cobb has looked pretty bad this year. Apart from that big week one game where he busted out like a big long touchdown um, and that kind of boosted his stats. Other than that, he's looked pretty washed and I think Cobb is probably done. Um, so we're looking at Allison coming back on the outside opposite of Devontae Adams, Cobb possibly in the slot. We have to see what happens with Marquez Valdez-Scantling because I think he's been very productive in the games where Cobb and Allison have missed. And I think it would be wise for them to use M MVS in the slot over Cobb, actually, or at least rotate them. But you're looking at Allison, right? He's played in four games this year. He's been active for four games. And if you take those four game stats and you pace him out to a 16 game, you know, a season, you're looking at 108 targets for Allison, 76 receptions, 1,156 receiving yards, and eight touchdowns. So Jerome Allison is a legitimate wide receiver too when he is healthy. They play at the Rams, who, again, don't have to uh, keep to leave, at New England, which should be a shootout, and then home against Miami, which Green Bay should, um, you know, take care of that defense. So I like Ron Allison. He's someone I would spend probably 10 bucks or so on as long as we get reports that he is healthy and ready to roll. Next up on this list is Cortland Sutton of the Denver Broncos, and he is 4% owned, and I'm not really excited about Cortland Sutton right now. The one thing I will say is... There are a lot of rumors going around about uh, Demarius Thomas, and the trade deadline is next Tuesday, I believe. So a week from today, I believe it's October 30th, around like 4 p.m., and I wouldn't be surprised to see Demarius Thomas moved at this point because they basically have a younger, more athletic, more 
productive wide receiver in Cortland Sutton over to Marius Thomas at this point. And I would love to see him play a little bit more. And we're actually seeing him start to take over more and more snaps. Last week, he played in just 1% less snaps than Demarius Thomas did, got in the end zone again. Um, and, you know, this is more so stashing him in hopes that Demarius Thomas does actually get moved at the uh, trade deadline. And then we have Christian Kirk on this list. You know, I'm not super excited about him, but the change at offensive coordinator from McCoy over to Byron Leftwich which might spark something in this offense. Kirk has led the Cardinals wide receivers in receiving yards in five straight games. They get two good matchups sandwiching their week nine by. They play San Francisco at home. They play at Kansas City. So I think in those games, Christian Kirk could be a wide receiver three in PPR leagues. Um, he's becoming Josh Rosen's favorite target in this offense. So uh, he's someone that you could, you know, if you're desperate, you could plug into your lineup. I'm not super excited because I don't think his ceiling is that high, but um, you could do worse than Kirk. And Traquan Smith is the next guy up on this list. And he is probably the most intriguing guy on this list for me. New Orleans Saints wide receiver, 17% owned. I picked him up in like three leagues prior to last week's game, hoping that he would emerge as a wide receiver too here, and he has done just that. So for those of you that don't know, TQ, that's what I'm going to call Traquan, TQ the God. He is the Saints' third round rookie wide receiver out of UCF. He is 6'2", 210, so good build for an NFL wide receiver. And he is the one who stands to benefit the most from Ted Ginn being placed on the IR. Smith, TQ, fits into this offense perfectly, in my opinion. Um, he, he not only operates as an all-around solid wide receiver, similar to Ginn, but his, you know, his specialty, his best part of his game is his downfield skills and being able to get down the field with like 4-4 four, four speed um, and, and high-pointing balls and, you know, just getting down the field and being able to catch the long balls from Drew Brees. And he needs someone like that in his offense. Um, Traquan, I think he averaged like 17.5 yards per reception in college. He is a downfield playmaker. Now, he had that big game when Drew Brees, you know, passed the, uh, the, the all-time passing yards mark or whatever. He caught three balls for 111 yards, two of them being touchdowns. Followed up Sunday with a pretty mediocre day, three catchers for 44 yards, but it was against a really tough Baltimore Ravens secondary. The big takeaway here, though, is that Traquan played on 73% of the Saints snaps, while Cameron Meredith only played on 25% of the snaps. And obviously, one of those two was going to emerge as the wide receiver, too. Uh, opposite of Michael Thomas in this offense, and it's clearly going to be um, Traquan Smith. Now, in week eight, the Saints travel to Minnesota. Uh, Xavier Rhodes actually left Sunday's game in Minnesota with an ankle sprain, and he might miss some time after, uh, you know, af after the injury. And the Vikings are already shorthanded at cornerback. Their, their first-round rookie pick, Mike Hughes, is, is on the IR. He'll be out for the season. Um, so if Xavier Rhodes is not there, they're really just banking on Trey Waynes to be their top cornerback and, you know, him being opposite of Michael Thomas, uh, TQ, that means he'll have a much easier um, time going against these top defenses. So I think he is actually a sneaky good play this week. Uh, he's going to be a sneaky good start in week eight if you are desperate against Minnesota. And he's someone that I think has long-term value for the season as he gets more uh, equated into this offense. And the last person on this list is Martavis Bryant of the Oakland Raiders, 4% owned. And this obviously comes following the Amari Cooper trade. Jordy Nelson is going to be the wide receiver one here. And he's the guy I would most like to be owned uh, in that Raider offense, but he's way more owned than Martavis and he doesn't qualify for this list. So Martavis Bryant is, uh, is an interesting play to me because while Jordy's going to have to take on the top cornerbacks, Martavis should you know, just by default, get a lot more volume with Cooper out of the offense. Now, Brian and Seth, <coughs> Seth Roberts both played on 73% of the snaps on Sunday, and I think they're both going to continue to split time, but I would much rather have Brian as opposed to Seth Roberts because Brian actually has a ceiling. Um, he hasn't been good, but he's going to be thrust into like the wide receiver two role in Oakland, and I think they're going to be in a lot of positive game scripts for the pass. The passing game, they take on Indianapolis at San Francisco, the Chargers. So some good matchups going forward. And I think Martavis Bryant is someone that you can uh, pick up and, and probably be somewhat happy with his production going forward. And lastly, and probably most frustrating, is the tight end position. I'm actually trying to make a move. So in the E-Town Get Down League, my roster is, is, is fire right now. We're on a five-game win streak. We're in second place. The only position on my team that is not filled right now, or not not filled, but like not top notch is the tight end position. So I have Jordan Reed, OJ Howard, and Vance McDonald on my roster. So I have three solid options, but I keep playing Reed and he keeps disappointing me. So I don't want to keep playing him. OJ Howard is looking good, but I also don't 
trust him to keep producing while he's not getting like a ton of targets. Although he was heavily targeted on Sunday, but I don't know if I, I can I can count on that going forward. I'm trying to I'm trying to grab Travis Kelsey because I own Patrick Mahomes as my quarterback and I want to trade for Travis Kelsey. Now I'm gonna have to do a two for one. However, I have like my wide receivers right now are Devonta Adams, Stephon Diggs, Robert Woods, Keenan Allen. So I have pieces there. My running backs are David Johnson, Philip Lindsay, uh, Carryon Johnson, Marlon Mack, Aaron Jones. So those first four guys, well, none of them are like elite RB ones. Like Lindsay, Carryon Johnson, Marlon Mack, all of those two broke out this weekend, and hopefully going forward it can be RB ones. So I'm trying to package up some kind of deal for Travis Kelsey um, because if I could sure up that wide receiver or that tight end spot, man, my lineup is going to be flawless. And I'm thinking of moving. We play two flex spots, so keep that in mind. And I'm thinking of moving maybe Keenan Allen and Philip Lindsay for Travis Kelsey, but I'm I'm thinking that might be too much value. I might I might counter it with because if I if I can move like one of those running backs, like Marlon Mack was on my bench last week, so it's not like a huge hit if I have to move Marlon Mack or Philip Lindsay because one of them will kind of just replace the other one in the lineup. Um, well, obviously you like to have depth. Uh, it's not really a big hit to my lineup, I guess. But I have to decide which wide receiver I want to move. And he, he initially offered Stefan Diggs and Philip Lindsay for Travis Kelsey. And I don't know if I want to get rid of Diggs, but I mean, it's obviously it's clear that Thielen is the wide receiver one there in Minnesota. And Diggs just keeps getting like the really tough cornerback matchups on the side. And I think like the big games are still going to be coming for Diggs, but it's hard to con- trust his consistency. So I might, I'm trying to decide between, you know, Devonta Adams is off the trading block and I'd rather not give up Robert Woods because he's just been so consistent. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking of pairing. I want to know your guys' opinion between Keenan Allen and Stefan Diggs, and then like Philip Lindsay, Carryon Johnson, and Marlon Mack. I'm probably not going to move Carryon Johnson because I think he has so much upside going forward. So between Diggs, Keenan Allen, and then Philip Lindsay and um, Marlon Mack, would you package a two for one for Kelsey? I want to know y'all y'all's opinions and why yes or why no you would do it. Um, so let your boy know. And uh, and we'll move on to the actual tight end position. So we have CJ Uzuma of the Mangles. He consistently keeps finding himself on this list. 52% owned. He's just on this list by default right now. And he gets a Tampa Bay defense that's absolutely gotten molested by tight ends so far on the year. Week in and week out. They have allowed 50 plus receiving yards and a touchdown from the tight end position in four straight weeks. Tampa Bay has. So Uzuma's next in line. Go grab him if you need to stream. Vance McDonald is only owned in 40% of leagues, guys. You need to grab him if you are desperate at the tight end position. He is a good play. He needs to be owned. He's probably better than 60%. I think rest of season, honestly, I might prefer McDonald over a guy like Jordan Reed. Um, so he came back right out. The first week he was back, week two, he, he got like a, a 25% snap share. So we kind of take that off the board. But apart from the one dud game he had, I know he had the big game and then everyone's like, oh, I'm excited to start him. And then he had the dud game, which is probably why he was dropped. But in three of the last four games, besides that dud game, he's been really, really good. Um, And he's been a big part of this offense. So Vance McDonald is really a great athlete. And obviously, if you've watched him play at all, he's been an absolute beast. And I think he is someone that needs to be owned in all leagues. So get Vance McDonald if you need to. I would spend anywhere from five to 10 bucks to get him or more if you are desperate at tight end. So Grab Vance McDonald while you can on your wire. Um, they play Cleveland next week, and while Cleveland's been good, they're not, you know, they're not a team that you necessarily need to like fear against the tight end. They play Carolina in two weeks, or I guess three. So it's Cleveland at Baltimore, Carolina. Carolina has been awful against tight end, so Vance McDonald should be uh, a stud in that game, even looking forward. So um, Vance McDonald, go grab him. Third on this list is Chris Herndon of the New York Jets, owned in one percent of leagues. Now. As I said with Robbie Anderson, the whole Jets like weapons core is banged up between Terrell Pryor, who's not even a Jet anymore, um, but Kinsey Nunwa, Blau Powell now. Chris Herndon is uh, a rookie tight end. He was their fourth round pick this year, and he's starting to emerge as one of Donald's favorite pass catchers in this offense. On Sunday, he caught four of seven targets, 42 yards, and a touchdown. He actually was really close to having two touchdowns on the game, um, so it could have been a much bigger game. But now he has back-to-back games in which he scored a touchdown. However, uh, he is still actually splitting time with Neil Sterling, especially in terms of being a pass-catching tight end. So 
While Herndon has been the producer here, and I expect his role to grow, it wouldn't surprise me if we, you know, if we see him kind of come back down to earth. So he's not, it's not like he's getting 90% of the snaps there and running routes on every one of his snaps. So that is something to be aware of before you get like crazy high on Chris Herndon. He's still splitting snaps with Neil Sterling, but I expect his role to grow. Um, and he's someone that maybe you could stash and keep an eye on, especially if you're in a much deeper league. So Chris Herndon's the last guy on this list. And we'll move to my defensive slash special teams streamers of the week owned in less than 55% of leagues. As always, guys, we look for three things in streaming defenses. I actually went back and in the E-Town Get Down League, I stream defenses every single week and I added up the fantasy points of all the defenses I have streamed thus far and they would be defense number one in fantasy football. So I've been impressing myself with the streamers that I've had on tap thus far. Um, the Redskins were my top streamer of last week. They ended up scoring a touchdown, so they did well. If you had them in your lineup, you look for three things. You look for the team that is favored to win. You look for the home team, and you look for a low over-under total in the game. If there needs to be a tiebreaker, just look at, is this defense actually a good defense in real life? It doesn't need to hit all three of those, but for the most part, if you hit all three of those, uh, you're probably set up for a pretty good streaming defense for the week. There are a few of them that meet this criteria this week. First up in the easiest stream this week is the Patriots. They're only owned in 52% of leagues. They're playing the Bills. They are on the road, which I don't like, but it is the Bills. Um, the Patriots are 14 point favorites and the over-under is only 44 and a half, which means Vegas has this game pegged at uh, Patriots are gonna score 30 and a half points and they have Buffalo at like 13 and a half or 14. So. That should tell you all you need to know. Bills are going to be with a backup quarterback again. Their offense, they might be without um, Shady also. So they might have nothing going. If you have the Patriots available in your league, they are easily the number one stream of this week. But there are a couple uh, other ones that are probably available in your league if you can't get the Patriots. And one of them is the Cardinals versus the San Francisco 49ers. The Cardinals are at home. They are actually one point underdog. So I don't love doing that. But if it is a low over under total, which... It's 43 and a half, which compared to the games that have been played in 2018, this is a very low over under total. So I like the Cardinals um, at home versus the 49ers, uh, a banged up 49ers team in a low over under total. So they are my second favorite streaming option of the week. And this is going to be crazy because of how bad they have looked in the beginning of the year. But this Chiefs defense is starting to come together a little bit, guys. And they're at home against the Broncos. They are 10 point favorites. They're owned in 16% of leagues, um, but they looked good against the Bengals, man. They looked really good. And um, and I know it's a reach here, and I, I probably don't feel comfortable starting this defense, but if you're desperate and these other guys are owned, like I, I think the Chiefs' defense actually might be a sneaky good play this week because they're home, they're favored. The other the, the thing that kind of sucks about this is the over-under is, is 56 points, and that's always going to be the case with the Chiefs because Patrick Mahomes scores so many damn points. Um but I don't know. I, something in my gut is telling me that the Chiefs defense is a good play this week because they've actually turned it on the last couple of weeks. Um, so Chiefs is there. And the last one is the Bengals. They are at home versus the Bucs. Uh, Winston has been ridiculously turnover prone as he always has been throughout his career. They are owned in 11% of leagues. They are four and a half point favorites. The over-under is pretty high at 54. But the Bengals defense is a decent defense overall. Uh, obviously, they got washed by the Chiefs. But, you know, rinse and repeat. What team doesn't get washed by the Chiefs? Uh, the Bengals have been a pretty solid defense throughout the year so far. And being at home, being favored, it is a higher over-under total. But I expect James Winston again to, you know, turn the ball over multiple times like he has done in almost every game. So um, Bengals will be the fourth team on this list. But go get the Patriots if you can. If not, choose between the Cardinals, Chiefs, and the Bengals. And I think you will end up being okay. That is going to conclude this week's top waiver wire ads. Again, guys, two things to say. Uh, I will be expanding the Big Dogs Network, so I want to bring on a couple people that focus on other fantasy sports, whether it is basketball, baseball, golf, I don't really give a shit. Whatever you specialize in, if you think you'd be good on camera, if you think you can bring some charisma and bring the research and the analysis that your mans brings and you think you'd be a good counterpart and you think you'd just be a good fit for the brand overall, let me know in the comment section, but I will be putting out more information on how to actually apply for the role. And... Uh, also, let me know about that trade I was talking about a few minutes ago. But otherwise, that's going to wrap it up. If you missed last week's vlog on Saturday, I suggest you go watch that because I got a lot of positive feedback and it was a, it was a fun one to make. So that's on the channel. It's the last vlog I put out. Um, thumbs up if you enjoyed the video. 
Subscribe if you're new to the channel, drop a comment down below, and I'll see y'all on Thursday for my buy low, sell high picks for week eight.